So what I'm going to cover, I'm going to cover the, these other things that in our curriculum, um, briefly talk about the uh, etiology and the presenting signs and symptoms, and also very briefly, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a talk, it's a surgical talk with surgical audience, and we need to mention some anatomy. Um, and then mention the classification of the different types of the thyroid nodules, as well as the investigations that we do with, with thyroid dysfunction. Um, and lastly, uh, a mention about the surgical management and the surgical controversies and, and what we discuss on the MDT when you're making those decisions. And lastly, um, just to be made aware that a lot of my talk is based on the British Association of Endocrine and Thyroid Surgeon Guidelines, um, which um, it's, a, it's a very, very good uh, resource to, to, to read around, particularly around your FRCS exam time for those sitting the exam soon. So the thyroid gland, um, as you know, it, it, it very logically arises from, from the permanent cecum um, and it descends and ultimately ends in the neck. Uh, the, the relevant structures uh, that are surgically relevant, as you know, is the nervous structures, such as the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve that we aim to preserve during surgery, if we can. Um, and the importance also is the parathyroids which are sitting adjacent to the gland and then the blood supply um, which is um, which is important so the superior thyroid artery comes directly from as an external branch so, as sorry as a branch from the external carotid artery and the inferior thyroid artery uh, which comes from the thyroid cervical trunk uh, what's different in terms of the venous drainage is that you have a middle thyroid vein um, but you do not have a middle thyroid artery so uh, it is a commonest endocrine malignancy. Um, uh, by the way, uh, I'm very grateful for uh, my colleague, Iktar, and also my very esteemed colleague, Karen Kapoor, for sharing their slides with me. And a lot of their, their material here are, are from, their, from their presentation. So I'm very grateful for their time in sending it and, and sharing it with me. Um, so it is a commonest endocrine malignancy, and it has got a, a good prognosis. Um, on the graph here on the left, which shows the incidence of the all thyroid cancer, and you can see it's on the rise. And that is partly due to the role of ultrasound is that we're detecting them more now than we did before. Um, and on the, uh, on, on the, on the right-hand side, again, showing the incidence of the, particularly the pillory thyroid uh, cancer. And again, all of them kind of showing a trend of increased incidence. Um, mm -hmm. So the way I'm going to base my talk is based on a patient journey. Um, when, what, how, when they, when they come in, when, what they tend to present with, how we work them up. Um, and then, then when they, if they make it to the decision making, when they return back in terms of whether to discharge or further investigation and then MDT discussion, and then eventually a prognosis and then make it into practice. So what they mostly tend to present with, they tend with the thyroid, they tend to come in with a thyroid, um, a mass or a thyroid uh, lump, um, and that's their commonest presentation. They can present with a lateral lymph, no lymph node, cervical lymphadenopathy, and I've seen some impressive cervical lymphadenopathy from papillary, from a very small papillary that metastasized the neck laterally, presenting them with a neck node. Um, I have a patient on the ward who uh, presented with a hoarse voice and she had a right vocal cord palsy um, and, and unfortunately just found out yesterday she has got anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. Um, so really her main presenting complaint was change in voice. Um, and again, we sometimes we pick them up on, uh, on radiological imaging, they come in with mediastinal adenopathy and um, and rarely they can have bone and lung metastasis and and they can be picked up when they usually picked up from other teams so this is a collection of, of thyroid lumps and some here as you can see this one um don't know if you can see my cursor or not um, but here this is a a lateral uh, thyroid mass and, and relate coming at you from the left lobe um, and these are just different presentations of thyroid mass. So this is tend to be a commonest way they tend to present. So what do you do in normal life? You take a history from the patient, you examine them, you 
generally send them for a battery or biochemical test. Um, and uh, usually what I tend to send them for are thyroid function tests um, because they have a, 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 a hyperthyroid picture or a subclinical hyperthyroid picture and you have a, a rate sonographically looking toxic nodule, then your management will be completely different from somebody with a normal thyroid function test. Um, so that's, that's quite important. And again, I picked up a couple of, of patients just by telephone consultations recently with Graves' disease because they had TSH receptor antibody raised and TPO raised. Uh, so please do remember to, to sort of, when to approach the thyroid gland, it's an endocrine gland, it's not just a neck lump. It's an endocrine gland and respect it like an endocrine gland. So do think of the investigation to check the function. And then they go into the ultrasound, they have sonographical assessment. And again, the BEATS um, guidelines are very useful here in terms of who to choose for putting a needle in their neck. Um, so depending on what this, your setup is, we have a, a one-stop thyroid neck lump now in, in East Kent. And, and, and that's a really good way, particularly if you try to diagnose those patients early to, uh, to meet our sort of national uh, targets. And, and in the UK, we have the 28 day faster diagnosis target now. Um, and really the thyroid, if you, if you will struggle to reach that without a one-stop neck lump approach. Um, and then further sort of cross-sectional imaging, either in the form of CT scan or MRI scan, depending on where your clinical findings and your sonographic pregnant. So what are the risk factors? Again, when it comes to sort of exam, if you get asked this kind of question, go back into a, um, uh, a categorizing way of, of answering your question. So a, a genetic, they can be associated with part of the multiple endocrine neoplasia. Uh, 2A and 2B, particularly with medullary thyroid carcinoma. And what's shown is that there is a, if you have an abnormal right oncogene, can cause a medullary thyroid carcinoma. But really the main two questions when it comes to the history taking is, is there a history of family cancer of thyroid in the, in the family? Um, so particularly relevant in papillary. My father had a papillary thyroid cancer. He used to come from back home in Iraq to the UK to have treatment. Uh, and he had multiple surgery with with the uh, neck dissection, and and you know he 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 lived and he passed away from another reason, um, but yeah, it does make me at being at a high risk uh, of it, um, and also associated with Gardner syndrome and familial adenomatosis polyketosis, where there is an association increase with papillary cancer. And we also know all about the radiation exposure. So either radiation to the head and neck, and some of my patients, they've had radiation due to lymphoma, um, either in childhood or an adolescent age. And we also know about the risk of um, radioactive substance exposure with the Chernobyl disaster that occurred in the late 1980s. And we get an Eastern European patient who coming in with cancer, particularly I see a few of them during my time at Guy's. Um, so really the main, to recap, the main thing in the risk factor in terms of when you're taking the history, is there a family history of it or is there any history exposure to radiation? Um, also, when you are assessing the patient, uh, age is important. I uh, have seen a papillary thyroid cancer in a child, in a nine-year-old child. So the extremes of age, are concerning me when they're coming in with a thyroid mass um, because the, the likely chances of being, being in cancer is higher. Uh, also, when they're coming in with a vocal cord palsy, um, that is quite a, a, a strong indicator that there is a thyroid malignancy. Uh, if they're coming in with a, a cervical lymphadenopathy, and or if there is a sudden rapid onset of a painless thyroid uh, mass. Uh, I, on my first week as a consultant, I had a patient who has had a thyroid mass for some years, um, U2, Thi2 uh, nodule, uh, changed rapidly and, and, and it, 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 it may have had a small papillary that de-differentiated to an anaplastic um, and sadly she died soon after that. So um, a rapidly enlarging mass, be wary. Examine them properly um, and then just have a feel how hard it is or not. Okay, so um, the, other, the other risk factors, particularly um, 
if there is a chronic history of iodine deficiency, they tend to get goiters, particularly in iodine deficient countries. They have come in with some impressive goiters from the Far East uh, that I've seen in my time. Um, it is commoner in male female, but by proportion, if you have male is a high is a risk factor for having cancer. Okay. Uh, and usually uh, tend to quite common in the young adults because we, we're now picking them up sonographically and the medullary thyroid cancer that I've seen have been patients in their 50s and 60s. So how we assess them, um, since the 2014 BEATS guidelines, um, we are now reliant on sonographic assessment I think in the beginning we had our apprehension about it because we we it depends really how much you trust your radiologist on this um and there is a variation on it but i think we, we're getting better at this now because this is now six years on um and it's well rolled out and we know it well so essentially for those who are not aware of it uh you one is a normal thyroid tissue you two is a benign sonographic module U3, when there is a indeterminate or equivocal findings. Four, when there is suspicion of cancer. And five, there are some confirming malignant features. Um, so what they do is that then they're the ones from U3 and above will get a needle in their neck, usually. Um, for those patients who are having a biochemical picture of hyperthyroidism, and sonographically, there is a, 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 a finding of a potentially toxic nodule. I generally tend to advocate not to put a needle in the neck. Uh, I request, this is the only occasion really where I request a nuclear medicine scan. Um, and if there is a, a, a hot uptake of the nodule, um, then I, I would, you know, I would avoid trying to avoid putting a needle in because the majority of them will come back as thi 3 f and then you go down the route of thi 3 f Look, surgical excision or hemithyroidectomy for a toxic nodule is an accepted treatment. Um, but it will be good to arm yourself with the information biochemically um, before you put the needle in their neck. So um, we in the UK, we use the thigh classification, which is a Royal College of Pathologists classification um, to, 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 to diagnose what sort of cells we get from the thyroid. And thigh one is primarily non-diagnostic, and that can be up to 10 um, percent of the samples, we aim to reduce that by uh, having a bi 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 medical scientist nearby to, to, to see whether we need to repeat the sample there and then if we can, uh, thi 2 being a, a benign finding, uh, and then thi 3 so these are the risk of cancers when, when, when they are picked up, so up to 10% of thi 1 can be cancer, that's because we don't have enough cells to, to call it. Um, and the thi 3 which basically are the indeterminate cytologically, uh, and they can be divided into A and F, A and A typical, these follicular lesion, and this is usually an MRCS sort of level question, you get a thi 3 f what do you do? Um, it, 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 sort of an answer at that level is usually is a hemithyroidectomy, uh, because you want to assess this, the nodule histologically, and if there is any evidence of basement membrane invasion or, or vascular invasion. And the only way you can tell that actually by taking the uh, that part of the thyroid out. Um, and thi 4 is suspicious for malignancy, or that's usually in the order of 75%. And thi 5 um, uh, we say definite malignancy, but the risk is 97%. Um, they can use different classification all around the world. When I went to Australia for my observership, they were using the Bethesda um, classification, which is pretty much akin to our thigh classification. So, the patient has come into your clinic, you, they present it to you, taken a history, examine them, you send them for biochemical test, you send them for an ultrasound scan, and then the radiologist made a decision whether to put a needle on their neck, depending on their sonographic findings. Uh, so this is sort of part of the decision making that will have to come back, you do, when the patient come back to your clinic. Um, so is the patient high risk? So is there a family history of it? Then, you know, have a high index of suspicion here. Don't accept a one thigh two um cytology from a patient like that i would urge you to ask to repeat it and i'm happier with with two thigh twos and these type of patient to to sit on them or discharge them um, so if they're high risk 
again, be careful, do, do encourage biopsy and highlight that you're a radiologist in your request form. They'll appreciate that, that you've, you know, taken a history, appropriate history from the patient, and then you highlight it to them because they are more likely to put a needle in their neck, even if they think it's you too radiologically. Um, if they are not high risk, then U1, uh, you tend to, U1, Thai 1, you repeat the uh, biopsy. <coughs> Excuse me. If they are type 2 and they're low risk, I'm happy to discharge them. Or if they're U2 now and, and if there is a good trust with the radiologist, I'm happy to discharge them. U3 and above, then they will get the biopsy. So which ones are the ones to now that you, they just got the biopsy, you've got the results back, your secretaries can bring back to you. Uh, and then which ones are the ones you want to discuss in the MDT? So the BEATS guideline I recommend from thi 3 onwards, they are discussed in the MDT. Uh, they usually quite, you know, we discuss them, but usually quite quick in decision making with them, with the thigh 3 f A and F. Um, and then the thigh 4 and 5, you want to make a decision about whether to do further cross-sectional imaging. So generally, what we tend to do, if they try 3 a tend to repeat the, the biopsy. Uh, type 3 f offer a diagnostic hemithyroidectomy, but then again, take the patient factors here. Are they, if the patient is an 85 or 90, do you really want to do a diagnostic hemithyroidectomy as in the best, patient's best interest? So take the whole picture of the patient rather than treat a biopsy, treat the patient. Um, so thigh 3 4 here there is a, 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 a debate um, whether to do, depending on the size of the nodule, if they're small, then I would offer them diagnostic hemi. And if it's a small cancer, that might be all what they need. Uh, and then the thigh three five, then again, you, you kind of picked up some cancer cells. You need to stage them. Um, and I, I do stage them at least with a CT of the chest to look for any distant metastasis. So when to do hemi, when to do total. Again, these can be a, a matter of debate in MDTs. Generally speaking, if they are four, less than four centimeter, I tend to advocate hemi. If they're a young patient, um, then I tend to advocate hemi, and if they don't have risk factor, you know, there's low risk in terms of. From a hemithyroidectomy, there is a risk of five to 15% risk of hypothyroidism. Therefore, six to eight weeks later post surgery, you want to check their biochemically, uh, what their status is. If they're big tumors, more than four centimeter, then there is an argument for a total. Um, if they are multifocal, uh, then again, there is a, an argument for doing a completion later, even if you've done a hemi. Um, if they're bilateral pathology, and sometimes I had a patient with I 3 f in one side, a three centimeter, and more than a four centimeter on the other side. And if it's more than four centimeter, there is a risk of um, sampling error. So they may, you might not get the solid component of, of the nodule. Um, that you want to assess. Um, so by, 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 by sort of uh, size criteria, you could offer them a, a, a total of the other side has got a, a nodule or a cyst more than four centimeter. And obviously if there is a neck nodal lateral involvement, um, then there is a, uh, then you would offer them a total thyroidectomy. So this is a publication uh, by Brito et al. in 2014 showing sort of the complication rates of, of from surgical intervention. Um, so what you can see here is from a lobectomy, um, the, the, we talked about the risk of hypoparathyroidism uh, is low from a lobectomy um, and from a hypothyroidism from a lobectomy. Uh, from a total, however, your, your complication will increase. Your risk of uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury becomes higher. Um, if you are doing prophylactic central neck dissection, then that even shoots up even more in terms of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury and risk of hypoparathyroidism. Um, so we don't tend to do prophylactic central neck dissection nowadays with thi 3 F lesions. Um, so, You've done your surgery, whether you've done a hemi or total, the specimen has gone into the pathologist and they will come back to you with some results that we'll discuss back in the MDT if you've taken them down the MDT route. So they either come back to you as benign, game, set and match, done. Uh, and they come back to you as malignant, 
and the majority are primary thyroid cancers. I recently had a renal cell metastasis into the thyroid gland um, and the patient had a renal cell carcinoma about 10 years ago. Um, so it was an interesting one to pick up histologically. And then the primary depends on where they come from. So if they're coming in from the follicular cells, then they are usually majority are differentiated type of thyroid cancer or rarely an undifferentiated type of thyroid cancer. And I'll explain really what the terminology here means, because it's not, you know, we talk about it a lot of actually to look in, what, what does it mean? Um, if they're coming in from the perfollicular cells, then that's medullary, or you can pick up lymphomas rarely, sometimes when you only do that after you've done surgical intervention and you get lymphoma in the thyroid. So really what, differentiation mean if it's a well differentiated that the cancer cell looks like normal cell that it grows from so it comes in from the follicular cells and it looks like follicular cells and they usually behave more indolently um in, 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 with the patient than an undifferentiated or poorly differentiated where the cancer cells look so different from the original cells that you can't really tell which cell it came from um, and I've got, unfortunately, this patient that I mentioned earlier with the vocal cord palsy, we had to do an open biopsy on her. And really, my, when my colleague opened the neck, it's like a plastered piece of tissue in front of her neck. It looks nothing like a thyroid. Uh, so and the, the biopsy came back as anaplastic. So really, that's what it means between differentiated and undifferentiated. So majority of the talk I'm bringing here now, I'm going to talk about the differentiated type of thyroid cancer. Uh, papillary is the commonest. Uh, it's about 80% of people who have thyroid cancer. And then you can have variation within it. So here we're talking about percentages of the type of cell. So if you have a follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, what it means is you are, have majority is papillary, but you also have follicular cells proportion in it. And um, if you have, say, for example, more than 30%, then as you get follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. And then within them, they have different histological features, uh, such as the diffuse sclerosing or solid type tall cells. These are sort of adverse histological findings. Generally, they tend to have lymphatic spread with papillary. Like I mentioned, they can be associated with genetic syndrome. Uh, and the mutation, the BRAF. Hey, now watch out for this. This is a an up and coming sort of molecular uh, aspect of thyroid disease. I suspect in the future we'll be doing far less diagnostic hemithyroidectomies than we are doing now, because we'll be relying more on their um, molecular and genetic workup in 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 in, in risk stratifying our patients. So the papillary microcarcinoma, when the histologists come back, by definition, it is, sorry, it is less than one centimeter, not altogether one centimeter, it's less than one centimeter, so that's a typo. Um, uh, it's about 30% of cases that we get. Um, and, and sometimes they do have nodal involvement. involvement. Um, usually it's very indolent disease um, the local recurrence rate is very low and the distant metastasis rate is even lower so majority of the time if you have a one focus of papillary microcarcinoma on your hemithyroidectomy and there is no adverse features in it usually that's you've had enough lacking with you know no further treatment is required what you do you go back into the ultrasound scan where there are any concerns on the contralateral side if there is none then you can discharge the patient you don't have to follow up the patient according to these guidelines If they have nodal metastasis, like I said, I have seen a patient with a microcarcinoma with quite a huge lymph nodes, uh, then they need to do a, a, a total thyroidectomy. So uh, from the other type of differentiated thyroid cancer, the follicular, it does resemble the thyroid itself by microscopy, and that's why it's difficult to differentiate it between it until you do a hemithyroidectomy. It's about sort of 10% of, of thyroid cancer. Uh, it is more aggressive generally than the than papillary uh, and, and, and about 30% of the thy 3 fr become follicular. The, the, the way they tend to have spread is by hematogenous spread rather than lymphatic spread. So rare, very extremely rare that you get a lymph node with a follicular. If you get one, look again, there may be another cancer somewhere. 
Um, in terms of the Hertel cell type of differentiated thyroid cancer, um, they, they, we get, we, you might get it in benign uh, disease, like in Hashimoto's and toxic, uh, and that's where you, your thigh, putting a needle in it in those type of patients, because sometimes you're not doing them a favor. You Look, the risk of cancer is, is not zero. There's never zero. Uh, but it's usually, you tend to be more relaxed if you have someone with Hashimoto's and you get a thigh 3F lesion. You may monitor it, surveillance, rather than doing surgery straight away. Um, it, they do come in sometimes when there's carcinoma, they, they can have a lateral neck disease, so nodal disease, uh, and they, it is the poorest, and when they do have Hertel cell carcinoma, then it's the poorest prognosis out of all the differentiated thyroid cancer. <clears throat> the, in terms of the, the controversy, whether you do central neck dissection or not, this was usually slightly more dated. <clears throat> Uh, slide here. Um, now we don't tend to do it prophylactically unless really there is high risk um, of extra thyroid extension. What, one benefit is that you do actually get accurate staging, but the as I showed earlier in the slide, the, the morbidity of it outweigh the benefit because actually there is no uh, survival benefit when you do it. Um, whether it's disease specific survival or overall survival, there is no survival benefit if you do a central neck dissection or not. Uh, and generally speaking, um, the, you need to treat 31 patients with central neck dissection to prevent one local recurrence, but the morbidity is high. So the, the way you prognosticate the patient, uh, you will, you will show you that different prognostic uh, tools that are used. All of them will have age in them, whether it's TNM, whether they are the uh, maces and ages and aces, you will see later. But the common denominator is that they all have age in them. So age is an important factor. Um, if they have a PET positivity, then the risk of, of cancer in that PET positive AVDG avid nodule is 30 to 39%. Um, and then again, if you have poor histological findings in the, in the specimen, like tall cell or columnar cell and vascular invasion, then the prognosis is generally slightly worse. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the, um, the pros and cons factors that I'm mentioning. The, you have different ways to, to, to prognosticate them, to give them a quantitative measure of them. The ages, <coughs> the amus and the maces, Really, what we use majority now is a TNM stage and the way we, we, we prognosticate the patient. And recently, there has been a change um, in the TNM. So for, instead of 45 being sort of the cutoff, uh, and now we, we is 55 years old. But you can see the, the all, all of them have age in them as a, as a, as a marker. Um, so what do you do? So the patient is, has had surgery. They've had now total thyroidectomy. Um, for whatever indication that they have, then, then there is a role for radio remnant ablation, the RRA. What is the pros of it is that there is evidence that it prolongs survival. Uh, and once you've done it, then where you, where you can monitor the cancer is by checking the thyroglobulin, particularly the papillary. And the sensitivity of the thyroglobulin is more when you do a radioactive remnant ablation. These are the factors you want to avoid. You want to avoid in pregnancy, um, obviously, because of the risk of um, to, to, to the baby. But it does have its own complications, so it's not to be taken lightly. So when do you do it and who to do it? Generally, if it's a bigger tumor, more than four centimeter, or there's extra thyroidal extension, uh, then that's an indication. If they're distant mets, and now, the, one thing I was sort of trying to get my head around when I was a registrar is that why do you want to do a total thyroidectomy in a, when somebody already has a distant metastasis? Because you want to remove all the thyroid tissue that you can have so that the radioactive um, iodine can go and hopefully more pop that distant metastasis. Um, and if you had a relative indication for it is when you have an R1 resection. So R1 resection means you, uh, so there's R0, R1, and R2. 
uh, R0 where there is no uh, residual disease, R1 when there is microscopic disease left behind, or R2 when there is macroscopic disease left behind. Uh, and then what you need to tell the patient is that they have low iodine diet pre-treatment. If you are giving a scan to, to stage them, um, avoid contrast, um, or if you give contrast, you have to wait six to eight weeks generally for them to have the radioactive iodine. And these are sort of the uh, high-low trial where they give to assess the difference between giving high dose and low dose of radioactive iodine, um, and they both showed equally effective. So they don't have to, it doesn't mean the higher dose means the, it will be more efficacious. So long term for patients, that's now about, say for example, now you're nine months post-surgery, we tend to do uh, dynamic risk stratification. Um, and that is, I'm not going to go in detail what it involves, but basically the, 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 what you want to do depending on their uh, response to their stimulated uh, and unstimulated thyroglobulin levels, then you kind of strict stratify them into low risk, intermediate risk or and high risk. And then that will make you, help you making decisions, particularly about how much to suppress them in terms of their TSH. We used to suppress, uh, to suppress a lot, particularly in differentiated thyroid cancer, but we relaxed the indication for it now. So if you have a patient and you're one of these units where you are yourself monitoring them afterwards, then what you need to check is the two things to, to monitor them. One is the thyroglobin, particularly in papillary, and then their antibodies. These two things come in hand in hand. You can't really interpret. If you have antibodies positive, then your interpretation of the thyroglobulin becomes you don't trust it as much because there is uh, a, a, a rise of the antibodies, it, particularly if they're low thyroglobulin. So what you want to look at, you want to look at the trend. So don't look at an isolated number. You want to look at the trend. Is there a rising trend of antibodies, but the thyroglobulin is the same? Then that may be a concern suggesting potentially local recurrence. And with these ones, you want to image them, um, image with ultrasound scan, uh, and if they are still avid, then we can consider further radioactive treatment. So when you are replacing the thyroid hormone, one thing to remember, we've changed practice. We used to give them T3 um, for a, 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 a four weeks and then stop it for two weeks before that. And then they have their radioactive remnant tablet ablation. But we found the patients, a lot of them were not getting it. They were quite badly thyrotoxic. So now we give them thyroxin, which has got a longer half-life, but we give them um, the uh, thyrogen, so basically to try to stimulate their hormone at that stage. So patients come back, unfortunately they have got metastasis in the brain or in the bone. Um, there are some avenues that you can discuss in MDT with the bone. You can offer external beam radiation therapy. Um, in the brain, uh, again, you can offer that, but then it becomes quite a, a sort of MDT-driven uh, decision. It's not an easy decision in those kind of cases. Um, so again, here just to show you the prognosis in terms of the, it, it's got a good prognosis and the way you can tell, the way we normally measure cancer is five-year survival, but in thyroid cancer, we measure 10-year survival. Um, so as you expect, the lower the stage, the higher the survival rate. Um, and generally speaking, when we say it's a good, it's, it's don't worry about it, it's a good disease. Yes, to a degree, but be careful when you use those kind of terms with patients because you, it is a cancer, uh, and I have seen people die from this cancer. So, um, what you need really say, look, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it, it has got a better prognosis compared to other ones. Um, but what you really need is good surgery uh, to, to clear the disease if it's a surgical disease. Um, because if you have poor surgery, and then that kind of results with poor outcome. And here, just to show the difference of prognosis by the histology, so papillary by far, the, most, the best prognosis. And as you go, the further down you go, the different types, then you have your prognosis gets worse. And unfortunately, with anaplastic tumors, all the ones I've come across, they die fairly quickly. Um, and the sort of the median survival is four to five months with these. Right. Okay. So I, um, how are we with time? We are 7.40. Shall we have a go at trying to make this interactive, Tommy? Sounds good. I'm just going to unmute, or allow people to unmute themselves. And then... 
There we go, I've done that. So now anyone who wanted to chime in a question is free to unmute themselves. Um, we'll give it a few seconds. Great, so let me see. I hope I can, can you see, what can you see? Can you still see my presentation? I've just lost your presentation. I can see, still see you. Right, okay, let's just go back into trying to get the... Uh... Um, I'm not waiting for anyone to pipe up. I've got one question from the chat. So we have one question about CT, which I believe you answered regarding contrast. Yep. The other question was, in a patient with a single nodule that is U2, but in the of Hashimoto's disease, would that be in mind about whether or not to repeat the uh, the investigations for that patient, or are you, are you satisfied with the U2 in the context of Hashimoto's? No, actually Hashimoto's and U2, that's even more reassuring. Um, so I wouldn't tend to repeat it in that scenario, no. It's, it's the thigh 3 f with Hashimoto's, then you kind of, that's where there's a debate whether just to, you know, and, and then this is a shared discussion with the patient. Some patient, the patient told you, look, take it out. I want it out. Are they concerned? Fine, I'll, I'll take them for surgery. But usually my, my suggestion to those patients, I said to them, if you're my family member, I would, I would watch it. Uh, I would, you know, watch it with ultrasound and see if there's any sonographical change. Excellent. Okay, guys, so if anyone's feeling shy and want to unmute and ask their question, feel free to actually pop it in the comments. I'm happy to read out for you as well. Okay, now well, let's see how it goes. So um, this is usually what you would get in an FRCS type of question, uh, type of scenario. Um, so you, this is a patient, you usually you get a picture, a 37 uh, year old female who uh, was found to have her, her fiance noticed that there is a, a swelling in the neck. Um, so really just describe what you see. It's a simple question. So let's see, can anybody want to, will, willing to have a, a go at describing the just a picture? No, any, any comments on that? No, no comments in the chat, so um, I, I don't know if this would inspire or discourage anyone to participate, but Ali, I'll say this is a critical, clinical photograph mm -hmm. in which the most obvious abnormality is a lump in the, the lower right neck. Mm -hmm. It should be most consistent due to its location with the thyroid lump, but I'd like to take a full history from the patient, focusing on their thyroid history, as you mentioned, uh, and on examination, I'd be mainly interested in whether this lump is mobile or swallowing and whether I can get below it before going on to investigation. Excellent. Well done, Tommy. And, and specifically in the history, what are your key sort of questions you want to ask? If you say you have a 30 seconds a scenario, like in a short case in the exam, what sort of question yes. do you want to focus on? Like with any lump, the onset characteristics and then the alleviating and exacerbating factors. And then in the history, family history, radiation exposure uh, or any other relevant syndromes. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent. Yeah. So as you mentioned, sort of family history, uh, any suggestion of genetic syndromes or history of, radio, history of exposure to radiation. Excellent, well done. So usually the second bit is uh, what we'd like to ask the patient, which you already answered. Um, and, and then in terms of the examination, you mentioned about mobility, anything else that you would do? Um, so as part of the standard neck examination, I would proceed to examine the lateral neck in pain and pathopathy. Mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, perform an intraoral examination as well as um, as well as the following that we mentioned. Movement on tongue protrusion is useful if you're thinking more of a thyroglossal cyst, but in this context, given the position of the lump, you're less likely to do that. Excellent, excellent. And then if they're thyrotoxic, you can do your thyroid status and also take for bruise and all that fun stuff. Great. And, and actually, just to, that's excellent. So uh, to add on again in the exam and, and to kind of get the target, the gold medal, um, you, you could do a few maneuvers such as asking to, and that's one of the ways I picked up the vocal cord palsy is, is, is just you can hear it from the patient, but say, can you count one to 10 to check, to check for dysphonia? And the other thing you could check for is for completeness is unlikely of a patient with this kind of picture, but they could have strido. So I tend to ask them to inspire through their mouth because that's the best way of trying to elucidate the strido. And that's what you could do to kind of put completeness of the exam, but well done. Um, Actually, you're changing them by that method as well, if you're seeing 
a cup proving thyroid, hypocardial uh, nitrogen invasion. Although exactly, exactly, because your highest, you know, high, your index suspicion will be high, and then you're going to carry out flexible nasal endoscopy uh, in in your first consultation, really, rather than. I mean, I don't tend if they have a normal voice, I wouldn't necessarily do a flexible nasal endoscopy in their first consultation. But if I'm suspecting that, or just from elucidating from that examination, then I would carry out flexible nasal endoscopy, and I picked up a, a pillory that has been appreciated in a young lady. We mentioned the BEATS guidelines, Ali. So, is it your practice, obviously, to, to do an F and E before all thyroid surgery? Once you're thinking towards surgery, F and E, I, I look in real practice. I, I only do it if I'm going towards surgery or if I have a clinical suspicion that yes. there is a recurrent laryngeal nerve involvement. Um, I would in F and E everybody, particularly now with COVID. Uh, uh, majority, in fact, these are the best patients for telephone consultation. I think, particularly in their in their initial um, workup. Um, yeah. What we do here at East Kent now, we've moved on a lot more to face to face, but we're still seeing the thyroid referrals as telephone in the first consultation. Guys, while we're chatting, I just got the next question up on the screen, and feel free to either. Chime in uh, if you've got anyone who knows what tests you want to ask. It's not a trick question, I'm sure. Um, yeah. If you put it in the chat, I'm happy to read that out for you as well. So please do chime in. We've still got a good number, a very good number of participants. So, yes. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, so write, write it down if you think you have. But the ultrasound scan has shown, come back, now they've gone to their ultrasound scan, has come back as 27 millimeter nodule. The sonographist was concerned and they done a, a, put a needle in it and they come back as side three. Um, so a question to the audience, what would you do next? Well, now they're biochemically euthyroid. Um, so here the situation is if they're biochemically hypothyroid, there is a scenario you could take or if they're biochemically euthyroid, then, then there's a different scenario that you could take. Let's see if there's any, any, any interaction on the chat function. I'm going to stay quiet on this one to give people an opportunity. Here we go. So, Mohammed Akram says uh, you could repeat the ultrasound FNAC. Mm -hmm. Option. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So, if it's a thigh 3A, Mohammed, that's correct. You, you would, mm -hmm. you, I, I would repeat it uh, again. And if there are multiple thigh 3As, then again, it's a discussion with the patient whether to, there is a risk of 15% of malignancy in these patients. Then it's a discussion with the patient and joint decision making um, whether to offer them surgery or not. Um, yeah, that's right. And yeah, and so Isabel has gone along those lines. So depending on the subtype, whether it's 3F or 3A, offering hemithyroidectomy. I think it is one of the point. Generally, five three Fs stay three F. Um, Mister says that if you thyroid, discuss the hemithyroidectomy with the patient. Good. Yeah. So based on what I think Andy's already said this evening, does anyone have any ideas what you could do if the patient was not be thyroid, although this won't necessarily be standard practice? Mm -hmm. okay. Any other investigations? Cool. Uh, I think, yeah, so if hypothyroid, Shubi says you could ask for nuclear medicine scan. Yeah. That's so right. <laughs> People listening. <laughs> people listening. That's good. Well done. Well done. Sorry, I, can't, I don't see. I'm not seeing your name, but well done. Whoever answered that. Uh, so that's really the only situation where I would do a, a nuclear medicine scan uh, is when uh, when when there is a, a biochemically hypothyroid picture. Great. So um, the objective was to <laughs> cover the curriculum as much as we can, and we we've gone through sort of the etiology, how they present, and how we manage the thyroid. Briefly talked about the anatomy. These are things you can read from the textbook, really. Um, we talked about the classification that of the neoplasia, um, and we talked about the surgical uh, principles of them. And then we mentioned about the role of the MDT. So for the last patient, if it's a thigh three, A or F, I would put her back on the MDT to discuss. Um, uh, to discuss her. And then we've mentioned the BEATS guidelines is what we use here in the UK. So in, in summary, um, just really what I think, what I would encourage you is to think of the thyroid gland as an endocrine gland and respect it like an endocrine gland. So take a comprehensive picture history, including patient's age, the whole picture of the patient, their comorbidity, 
and what the patient want um, when because that will help in decision making in the MDT and make that in a clear letter uh, if because you're not yourself presenting them in the MDT and then the MDT can get a, a consensus of what the patient wants that will help making decisions um, and and then yeah look at their biochemical picture because uh, that will help you in your decision making and if you've gone down the route of surgery please you know train yourself as well as you can be with the surgery so you can do a comprehensive surgery uh, safely um, and generally speaking this disease is is, 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 a, is a it has got a good prognosis but you do need to go through the journey of the patient uh, to go through the journey of treatment and one of the one I always asks people around what what the main message from the MDT when I'm trying to give a talk what, what would you like to tell the audience um, and Fahim, who was the um, who was sort of in charge of the post-operative care of thyroid patients in terms of their radioactive iodine, um, he's got a background in medicine. So really, the main message is when you tell the patient, yes, it's got a, it's a good disease, but it, it could have poor prognosis if they don't engage in treatment, and and some don't engage in treatment, particularly post-operatively. So um, just mention that they need to go through the journey to have go to to get that sort of good prognosis picture of the of the thyroid cancer and uh, really that is all i have to say and i'm happy to take any further questions fantastic yes i did i just skip a few i'm just going to just scroll through and quickly check we haven't shortchanged anyone so the question about ct plagal with contrast you did you did say that you you gap of six weeks from following contrast administration yeah. uh, do you have a preference in the, UK, in, the, in the uk i would say commonly by the time the uh, the patient made that journey of going through getting the scan until they have their further radioactive iodine ablation. That's usually about six weeks anyway. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's not so much of yes. a problem. If you're across the, the Atlantic and you're in the States and you get operated on a lot quicker because it's a different sort of tariff system, then yeah, that's quite relevant. But yeah, in any, for exam answer, that's what you, mm -hmm. you need to do is what. <laughs> Um, then we had a question from Rui about Phi 2 psychologic grading, and I believe from Ali's slide, the, the evidence you quoted was that a Phi 2 has it carries still with it a 3% chance mm -hmm. of malignancy. Yeah. I believe that, that is up to 5% in some, in some series. Uh, so even though you say to the patient, we've done a, a legal test and it's yeah. nice. Uh, and and just like the patient that I've, I've mentioned earlier, she had a Phi 2 uh, benign sonographically, but it de differentiated and became cancer so yes there is it's very small don't let that number scare you but yes there's always is there's never zero percent in medicine and we don't know it's necessary with certain nodules whether they you missed a cancer or whether they became a cancer um, mm, yeah that's, well, that's the other thing is always sampling error um, the logic is that you have a nodule because there are some abnormal cells there but yeah because you, know, you can't go back in time to look at those, those cells when they first do that differentiate differentiated or whatever that's right. But I think that's where the molecular medicine really will come in in the future because that yeah. will help us in, in, in risk stratifying them. It's liquid biopsies, as they like to call them in thyroid. For, for liquid biopsies. Oh, no. That's um, not. I've learned something. This is an interesting question from um, Finnish. If you couldn't do a CT for staging, what would be the preferred modality? So I guess this is going back to probably what we used to do. Sorry, just repeat the question. I didn't quite catch it because it's slightly cutting off. If it wasn't for CT, how would you speak to the patient? So, for example, in the past, a chest x-ray would have been sufficient. Yeah, to exactly. Yeah, yeah. That is how they used to do it. Today, just chest x-ray to, to stage the, the people to look for uh, lung metastasis. But if you get a strange scenario, the patient understands the radiation exposure risk from CT and would like to consider other modalities for staging, what would you say to them? That's an interesting question. Good. Yeah, that's a good question. It tends to metastasize to the lung, which, by, because it's a mobile organ, doesn't tend to image very well with MRI. Yeah. A chest yeah. x-ray, wouldn't you? I would do a chest x-ray, but however, in terms of the primary, if you're looking for meta, I would do a chest x-ray, but in terms of the mm -hmm. primary, uh, if there is, for some reason, they can't have CT scan, then I would do an MRI scan. Yeah. Do, for the neck. Laryngeal MRI, some radiologists, I guess, would say, when, when there's, at least an STC, when there's equivocal findings on a CT, then many radiologists are saying, let's do an MRI and see with the additional information. That's right, yeah. Additional what have you, whether they get an answer. Correct. Yeah. Um, I'm just scanning through. Um, I hope I haven't missed anyone's questions. I think that's everyone. Oh, yeah. One, one from Nora just at the end there. Do you discharge low risk for pillory after heavy thyroidectomy or monitor, monitor the contralateral remaining low? 
because what we do too much was de-escalation of surgical therapy in, in early differentiated thyroid cancer. Yeah, so that's a good question. I, I, my belief is the BEAT guidelines, if it's a T2 or less, uh, you, you monitor them for five years. Um, and and the, I monitored them with a, with a yearly ultrasound scan, and after five years, I discharged them. Yeah, and that's the practice that, that guys in this. Yeah. It's not something that's become sort of enshrined in any national guidance, but with increasing evidence of that being a safe thing. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 other, the other sort of subject of debate is, is there a role for thyroid globulin monitoring in these patients? I'm, I, from my understanding, there is not much evidence in this to, to support it. Um, I hope not to date, but I think, I think the BTS were going to update their guidance and have additional information on these, these exact factors. So unless COVID has delayed it, or unless I've missed it, watch that space and hopefully yeah. we should have some, some national guidance fairly soon. Yeah, good. And, and then Isabel suggests, well, would you not do a non-contrast CT better than a chest X-ray? And yeah, yes, it would be. A, a non-contrast CT would be. Yeah, yeah, if you can do a CT scan, then yeah, non-contrast CT scan. Uh, but if, if, you, if the patient... I'll be an advocate for if, in an unlikely scenario that you just couldn't do a CT for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah, it's an unlikely scenario, but yeah, non-contrast would be my second one, and then just X-ray if, if there is strong concern about radiation exposure. Well, it's, it's fair to say, and if we kept you, I guess, beyond the, the usually advertised time, we're really grateful again for the ongoing support of, of this project, and, and hopefully, judging by the attendance, which is very strong, that other people are also being benefit of that. Uh, and as always, we say we're really, really happy to have you back and do another talks. Hopefully. Yeah. Some Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Oh, before you sign off, Ali, I, I have a couple of questions for you as well, actually. Go for it. Um, it's actually more of a two-pronged question. Firstly, when we were discussing about uh, the low risk of cancer in a Thai 2, being 3% mm. or less, or in some centers up to 5%, would mm. you offer a patient discharge or hemilobectomy as the two on, only two options, or would you just uh, I mean, look, sometimes you get the patient with thy 2 but the patient really wants the thyroid out. Um, and in that kind of scenario, it's, it's, I respect the patient wishes and offer them a hemithyroidectomy. The other, the other sort of way you could, you could kind of, you know, talk about it is there, if there was any concern about compressive symptoms. I mean, really, how much of it's compressive symptoms related to the thyroid? Yeah. Oh, nobody knows really the real answer to that. But um, usually, I'm, I'm again guided by the patient. If the patient is very keen to have a hemithyroidectomy, um, then you know I, I would dissuade not to. Um, but again, I just like I said, I'll take the patient wishes in, in, in the decision making. And for thigh threes and above, yes. would you take every patient preoperatively to the MDT or? Would you take some preoperatively and some after you've done a hemilobectomy? Yeah, no, I think the BEATS guidelines suggest that every thigh three should be discussed um, because when you are, admit, when it helps you in making the decisions, because if you have a thigh three lesion, but you have a concerning sort of graphical finding, because that's going to push you towards surgery, right? Um, so I, I do put every thigh three towards the MDT. If they're a straightforward patient with a thigh 3F and patient one surgery, then it's usually a one-line discussion um, in the MDT. But yeah, I do put thigh 3 as per the recommendation from BEADS guidelines. Brilliant. Thank you, Ali. That really clears up everything for me as well. Thanks, no. Tommy. Thanks for uh, moderating today. Really appreciate Perfect. it. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, all, and, and uh, stay safe.